Welcome to the Global Tech Leaders Podcast, where we help business leaders and individual contributors with actionable insights to hit their number and figure out the nuances of truly operating a business globally today, squeezing the essence of the lessons learned from the planet's top tech leaders. This is your guide to joining the fast track to global market scaling. Today, we are joined by Nakaraju Bandaru, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Mosaic. Um, he's a product executive that comes with 20 years of experience in innovation, architecture, product delivery, and operations, and has led growth and transformation initiatives for startups, private equity groups, and large public companies. Prior to Mosaic, he served as VP of, and Chief Technology Officer of Brevan Division of Clarivate Analytics, formerly part of Thomson Reuters and held executive product development and customer care leadership positions at Intuit, no less. Uh, I know because I'm a customer of theirs. He holds a master's degree in computer science from the University of Hyderabad. So a bit like me, a computer geek, I'm also a computer scientist uh, as well. So welcome to today's show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Ross. And thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Well, look, let's kick off by um, kind of our usual style, which is tell us about you. I'm always curious to know on our guests what brought them to where they are? A lot of people say it was very deliberate. Some people say it was complete accidents. Some people say it was fortune fees, uh, meets a prepared mind. So, you know, what was your journey, your education, some of the companies you were a part of uh, that led you to be where you are today? If you could share that journey and some of the inflection points, if you could uh, let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I started off, um, you know, as a very, uh, 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 family member from a very small middle-class family back in India. Mm -hmm. And my dad was a central government employee. And, you know, one of the perks that he got was he kept moving us around every two to three years uh, across India. And so we would be in a different state speaking a different language every three years. And, wow. you know, in, some way, in, in so many ways, at the time, it felt like it was very hard on me. You know, didn't have too many friends. Hmm. You know, the moment I started making some friends, we were off to a new place. I think reflecting back, it was probably uh, one of the things that actually, while there were some downsides, it helped me in so many ways in terms of where I am today. It has helped me shape my future. And also, I think there were a lot of learnings that uh, came along with that. I think, you know, uh, in so many ways, I learned different languages, different cultures, we were a very middle-class family, so we needed to figure out how to work with financial constraints. And then the challenge was also to figure out and take the right amount of risk. I think every time we moved, my dad would move ahead of us, and then I would be responsible for packing stuff, getting there, making sure. So as a child, I was the oldest uh, kid of three. And so mm -hmm. that helped me in so many ways in terms of just having responsibility. As I grew older, uh, I went to school in um, uh, Hyderabad and Kakinada, which is an uh, engineering college there. I was a little bit of a late bloomer, you know, uh, uh, you know, did okay in school. But as I go got older, I figured out the ways of uh, really uh, understanding the things that interested me. I was always good at solving problems. So engineering was a little bit in my background. And then over time, um, I started to figure out that it was not just about being an engineer, but it was also about communicating. It was thinking about solutions in a broader context. So that really helped become uh, kind of the stepping stone of a lot of what I am today. And so when I got to uh, doing my master's in computer science in Hyderabad, you know, the tech was just about booming then. Mm -hmm. Mm. I got one of the first U.S. tech companies to come there, and they interviewed me, and I got a job uh, through a campus interview. Spent about a couple of years there in India working on various technologies. Obviously, um, you know, due to a variety of constraints, higher education in U.S. was never on the cards for me. But when I got an opportunity to come here on an H-1B, mm. it just felt like an opportunity I couldn't pass up. Mm -hmm. And so I got to the US in early 90s. And, and, you know, the technology landscape, the global landscape was quite different. You know, here I was 
uh, with very limited means and resources. And I just saw what people uh, were able to do. One of the earliest companies that I worked, which uh, was called 4S at the time and later went on to become the largest ISP at the time called Exodus. I just saw how companies went from two people company to becoming a multi-billion dollar company. Sure. And so it kind of really laid the foundation for what I thought, what I wanted to be. And so from there on, I joined Lockheed and, you know, I spent a good five years there. I understood what large, solve, you know, big problems were, how you solve for large stakeholders. And it also got me exposed to a lot of algorithms and stuff that generally software engineers don't think. You know, one of the earliest things I was working on was how do you fit cables in a very limited space and missiles and those kind of things? And that was like a really, uh, you know, uh, fuzzy problem, sure. not a typical software engineer type of thing. So it got me thinking about multiple dimensions. So, so a lot of those really different experiences shaped me in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in bringing and evolving my career. So from there on, I moved to a company called Covad. Uh, which really was one of the first companies that shaped where I am today as a leader. And the reason was the person who hired me there put me in charge of a job that needed a solution, not at the point in time, but three years out or further down the road, which was a scaling problem, not an immediate problem. And I struggled with trying to solve for something that was not very obvious at the time. But looking back, it was one of the things that I did well despite being in the gray area. And it certainly helped me figure out that you need to think through two, three, four, five years ahead and how you lay the foundation for that. That helped me then land the job with the founder of Covan. And I went on to become the VP of software engineering for a wireless mesh networking company called Metrofy. Mm. And, and one of the things that I learned there was, you know, I started as a VP software, but then I had additional responsibility of leading network and also RF. And through that process, I learned that you never say no to an opportunity. If anything came my way, I would take that opportunity. I'd be like, I would put in 18 hours, 20 hour days because I wanted to learn that job. And it got me going. I think I enjoyed that learning, uh, the, the, you know, the staying hyper-focused in the moment because I did not know I had, you know, one of the hardest thing was to figure out you know, what I had learned in my physics in high school and college days and apply that to real life, you know, yeah. when I became also uh, the leader of the RF engineering department. It was very hard, but uh, that helped me there. And then I, when I went on to start my company, Bura, uh, one of the key lessons there was to really think about being a founder, not just as a CTL, but also everything you need to do as a founder of a company. I did sales and marketing. I did technology development. I did strategy. I did fundraising. And then towards the end, when we needed to start generating some serious revenue, I hit door to door. I can't remember how many days I would be parked in front of a restaurant waiting for the owner of the restaurant to show up. Uh, just to be able to get a meeting with them. And so uh -huh. what it takes to do the hustle in terms of just getting a reading, those things helped me. And so those are probably the startup base that I would say really shape who I am today, because I think that tenacity and intensity is critical to even what I do today. You got to think scalably, but those basic characteristics are really critical. And from there on, I joined Intuit. Intuit acquired my company. I think it was 2009. Uh, it was a graceful exit because fundraising was a very hard time at that time. And then uh, we didn't have scalable revenue to uh, you know, get to the next level. So it felt like a great opportunity to join Intuit. They acquired us. And one of the things that I learned at Intuit really was around leadership skills. Till that point, I was a doer. I was someone who was scrappy got stuff done. I was a technologist at heart. But I think Intuit taught me a lot of the leadership skills that I have today. It really taught me how to scale, how to think big, how to think about team members more than myself. And it was a hard skill to learn for someone who was so wired and someone who just rolled up the sleeves and did it every, you know, every day. 
Um, loved my stint at Intuit, but after six years, it was my longest stint. I hadn't planned on spending there more than six months as a startup guy, but ended up spending more than six and a half years there. And then most recently, prior to Mosaic, I joined a company called uh, Claravate, which was a Thompson Reuters spinoff. And there I learned the private equity business, how to fundraise, how to sell uh, in New York and being able to pitch the company to large investors and be able to execute on a plan in terms of just really putting on a roadshow and thinking about how do you scale uh, and uh, get an exit out of a business. So that was very helpful. About that time is when I started looking for my next opportunity, and it really was a pivot point for me. I had become an empty, empty nester at that point. And when I talked to the folks at Mosaic, mm -hmm. it really connected with me in so many ways. I love the leadership team. I love the culture, but it was also something about doing more than a career, more than just being in the rat race. It was about trying to do something bigger than what I was. And so uh, the mission orientation about climate, uh, the ability to make an impact, even though I directly wasn't involved, I thought I could contribute to that in a pretty meaningful way. Uh, so Mosaic really has provided a huge, huge foundation. And after two and a half years, every one of those reasons that I joined Mosaic still holds true. Uh, it's a great company, uh, great team, and then the ability to make an impact, I think, keeps me up every day. So um, there's a little bit about, uh, uh, wow. about my background. That's a hell of a journey and very insightful. I appreciate you sharing it. Um, I definitely want to get to Mosaic because it's an area I'm very passionate about myself. Um, my inner geek um, you know, likes to explore that sort of stuff for sure. Um, and with rising energy prices and inflation across North America and the Eurozone going through the roof, um, I think it's the perfect time for that. But we'll get to that. Um, one of the things I wanted to jump in on from what you said was um, the, the real sense of hustle I got from you, the real sense of hunger. And I think and we, we only um, had and we have quotes that we put out in social media every day of the week. And one of them was effectively what you mentioned that you know, you have to be ready for opportunity. You have to be knowing, you have to have done your prep work and recognize it for what it is in order to execute on it to be successful. Because the reality is, is opportunities come by like a conveyor belt. They're like buses, right? And the smart folks know that, you know, it's not about the gambler's mentality. It's about um, there will be a next one. And you may be, in fact, more mature and more experienced and more ready to, to execute upon it when it, when it arrives. But one of the things as part of that journey, I think, from what you said was, you know, you really needed to, I liked what you said about going to a new place. You kind of, you were forced out of your comfort zone. I did that as well. I went away to a new country with no friends to a university. I did the same thing. And um, I've come out of that with lifelong friends. I've been groomsmen at weddings. I call people up in Dubai, Canada, and the US, and I stay in their places for weeks on end because I can, because of those relationships, uh, which is wonderful. But I think, you know, you really, I mean, the knocking on door stuff, I mean, it doesn't get more gritty than that, right? My question is, how important is that in leadership? So like, when you have gone through that journey to come to leadership, and you, you kind of, you mentioned that you walked into Mosaic, and then when you're hiring, right, when you're interviewing for leadership, like, where in your value set is, is that and how important is that and like how fundamental do you feel it is for success? Like I'm not saying everyone has to be like you, but for me, it's pretty clear that it's important, right? So take me through where that kind of sense lies for you and your kind of pecking order of values as it were. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the hustle, you know, we're all competing with different things in our life. I think there's new companies that are coming. There is never a time where you really sit back and take things for granted. Even the largest companies um, uh, have the, you know, new uh, competitors, new technologies. So, so in some sense, the hunger is a key part of both learning and mindset. But to you, going back to your question, the way I've generally thought about from a leadership perspective, where things stack and, and why that hustle is critical is because you gotta have a strategy in place first. You need to think about what's the balance between short and long. You can't just be hustling on the short-term stuff. So the strategic acumen to think about what is important to hustle in the short-term and how do you think about the longer-term is important. 
the hustle in some ways comes critically as part of the second value I think about, which is really drive for results. Mm -hmm. Because in my job today, there are times where I want to make my team, you know, be responsible. I want them to own their outcome. But there are times for me to step in. The how is really critical. You know, the, I have a framework that I use, which is called red, yellow, green which is you set a goal, set up goals, be very clear upfront with the team on what they mean, how you measure them. Yeah. And then there's a green zone, which is you let them kind of play in the green zone. As you get into the yellow zone, it really is important that as, as a big stakeholder in the organization, your organization is delivering for the larger organization, but you're also giving the playground and the room for the team to play in that. And the yellow zone is where you start to kind of start observing more, getting more data, trying to figure out and also start to uh, be a little bit more active in coaching them. And then when you get into the red zone, you know, you're in, in the sausage making and you gotta have that instinct and the mindset to say, now's the time to go and be in the sausage making. How you do that transition from green to yellow to red is really a key part of how you inspire your team. If you don't have a framework, if you're not communicating with the team clearly, that can feel very unraveling and very hostile. But if you can do that well, the team members learn a lot. And I've found that from people who've done that incredibly well, uh, mentors, and also people you know, uh, who've not done it well. And I've had personal experience seeing that. And so you learn from that and eventually say, if I don't like something, one of my team members may not like it that way. So if you can reflect on it that way, it certainly helps. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I think there's power in um, leaders walking the walk rather than just talking the talk and you know executing as well at the same time. So I think that's really, really critical. Um, so tell us a bit about... Um, where you are now in mosaic so mosaic very much pitched in the green sphere at the moment an area that i'm very passionate about and um, i won't get into the climate change debate it's more around you know is it a good idea to reduce carbon emissions in the atmosphere yeah it's a good idea is it idea to get free energy from the sun yeah that's a good idea um so we're seeing massive adoption of that certainly here in europe with folks wanting to subsidize their electricity costs trying to remove fossil fuels from their consumption patterns uh, rely solely on electric um, certainly the barriers thus far to date had been largely around cost etc tell us a bit about mosaic and your journey and, and why you're so passionate as cto there yeah so uh mosaic our our founder uh you know he is uh, such a passionate advocate for climate change and he has been involved in this right from day one his college days and and when you have a founder that's that involved, that passionate, I think, you know, that just flows into the DNA of the company. And so uh, as a new person, relatively new person coming in uh, two and a half years ago, you cannot be but influenced by such passion and uh, such desire to make an impact. I think Mosaic as a company, our vision is clean energy for all. You know, we have a really uh, a lofty vision. But I think the way we go about doing that is really trying to empower people to prosper from being able to achieve um, you know, the best way to finance that clean energy. Let me explain what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of clean energy technologies that are commercially available today that are actually available to solve the carbon emission, the greenhouse emissions problem. The technologies are there today. One of the uh, things about all these technologies is the huge upfront cost that's involved in there. You know, there mm -hmm. was a recent study that I saw uh, where, you know, it could take up to $70,000 today for you to make your home relatively carbon free, whether it's getting solar or whether it's your EV charging or, uh, you know, anything else that you want to do in terms of uh, energy efficient windows, roofing, and all those kind of things. If you wanted to do all of that, you know, seventy thousand dollars is a lot, and there's a lot of upfront cost in in being able to do that. Even though it's economical down the road, uh, the upfront costs are pretty substantial. So our benefit, our mission is really to be able to finance that, make that financing available in the best possible fashion, most affordable uh, fashion, 
and make that experience a very seamless one to the homeowners. And in doing that, um, you know, we can scale our business and at the same time deliver the business, uh, the value to the homeowner. To date, we have financed about 180,000 um, home improvement projects. And then, you know, we, and that has resulted in over $5 billion uh, in loans that we've uh, uh, generated so far. So, so, so all of that and the scale that we're able to think about being the platform that we are uh, really is very exciting time to be and very exciting place to be at the moment. So I suppose, um, what's your kind of inflection point? So where do you step into the mix where, you know, obviously there's a, a notion in people's minds that um, green is the way to go. They see the upfront cost. How, what's your go-to-market look like? How do you enable, what's that journey look like as a homeowner? Yeah, you know, actually you touched on something that's really important, uh, you know, and, and I think this is really true of uh, everyone uh, in America and globally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're from a red state or a green state or you're a you know, blue state or your affiliation uh, is with a Republican or Democratic Party. The value proposition of going green now is economic. And who doesn't yeah. like an economic incentive? I think the benefit of being able to um, you know, uh, get green energy, and then be able to uh, save money on your utility and power consumption is, is a huge value for everyone. Our go-to-market today is primarily, you know, we're a B2B to C company, which means we work with a large number of installers, we work with a large number of dealers, um, and, um, and partner with them to provide financing as a very simple part of their experience and how they deliver the value to uh, the homeowner. So imagine a large company that does solar installation. Uh, we have a number of partners uh, all the way from uh, uh, Sunrun to Freedom to Vivint, uh, all these partners that uh, actually are in the business of installing um, uh, solar installation. So when they knock on the door uh, and, and uh, pitch a solar installation, um, and the homeowner gets on board and they say, yeah, uh, I'm ready, but it's going to cost me $30,000, $40,000, $50,000. We make that point of sale financing really simple at that moment. It really is uh, a four or five data fields, a simple mobile experience where they can input their a uh, couple of private pieces of information on their own screen, uh, completely private and secure, mm -hmm. and, and the ability to then qualify on the spot uh, for the loan that's involved in that project. And then we take the hassle out of the homeowner because we confirm that the contractor has completed the various stages of that project. And then as they get completed uh, through various verifications, whether it's homeowner or through other ways, we then disperse those funds to the home uh, to the contractor, so the contractor gets the loan amount directly for the project that the homeowner is getting done. So the hassle for the homeowner is really uh, non-existent from the financing point of view. They just get the project, they get it uh, turned up, and then they start uh, leveraging the value of the green uh, uh, energy coming their home. So, so that's really how we deliver a lot of our um, uh, technology. Uh, in in various uh, ecosystem partner uh, enabled channels today. And then about a couple, three years ago, we also expanded this to home improvement business. So now we have partners uh, that do windows, that do roofing, and that do a variety of other home, uh, home improvement projects. So we're able to deliver the same seamlessness uh, for financing to those projects as well. So So that's a little bit of how we go to market today. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, well, look, let's get into that. So I suppose for our, our listeners um, and, and from my kind of layman's but enthusiast's perspective, um, I'm aware of different things. Having done a home remodel myself last year, we improved our insulation quite dramatically. We drilled our cavity walls and filled them. We increased our uh, insulation on the inside to like 100 millimeters, four inch insulation. Um, and we also improved our heating system and we're looking at now direct. So there's two different types of solar you can do. There's solar direct provision, which subsidizes, which does feedback to the grid around excess. And then you also have storage, which makes the most sense. So 
again, from a layman's perspective, and correct me where I'm wrong, what the challenge you have, and depending where you are on the planet, we're quite far north here. So we actually get in the summer a lot of daylight and we actually get more benefit than if you were in, say, Central Europe, because in our in our kind of spring, summer, uh, autumn time, we have more hours of daylight. It's nothing to do with the power of our sun, which in the British Isles we get none of. <laughs> it's all to do with the amount of daylight because it's a photovoltaic. It's a uh, process as opposed to a thermo uh, type of thing. But you can also then in the morning time is when you need it the most. And sometimes in the winter it's dark, so you need to store that during the day to keep to use it. And then at nighttime you want to put on your dishwasher, your cooking all that sort of stuff. So you need to draw down on that. And that's where you store it actively and draw out from where you need it. And then you can also sell that back to the grid. There's also some really cool, funky technology around EVs where you can store the energy from the grid in your car when it's not needed, when it's parked um, and sell it to the grid and then buy and then use it when you need to as well. So maybe just take us through some of those innovations and where you're seeing the most demand and what makes you excited about this technology. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll start with I think the battery part uh, that you talked about. Yeah. One of the, uh, you know, m we were one of the first companies uh, all the way back to 2016, where we did battery only loans. Today, battery is more mainstream than it was sure. at that point. You know, a mosaic started with in 2014. Uh, we were a pioneer, uh, basically offering a solar loan, uh, and um, you could uh, have a 20-year loan, which at the time was a very long time for a uh, solar panel, but um, uh, the technology has evolved and we were able to uh, deliver a fully digital experience in terms of delivering that 20-year solar loan. But in 2016, um, you know, with the battery-only loans, and then as we've looked at the technologies today, I think obviously uh, we're seeing uh, people want to combine solar projects and other home improvement bundled uh, projects. So, mm -hmm. so we had to introduce loans that basically were uh, for solar plus, you know, if you wanted to do a multiple um, set of projects, then you could get them all done. Uh, the way that we've seen this evolve is, uh, you know, the consumer is, the homeowner is obviously thinking about each of these in what they're able to afford, what their monthly payment is, uh, you know, how does that compare to what their electricity bill is or their monthly utility costs are? And so the ability to think about what the right financial product is. So, you know, sometimes you can take a longer term loan uh, with a lower interest rate and then actually lower your monthly payment and then you can finance these additional projects. Uh, so the ability to think about projects as staged projects, so you can complete the insulation first, then you can complete the windows and then you can get the solar done. The ability to do those types of uh, projects and stages and the ability for our software to be able to support those various stages of projects, uh, we've found that to be very valuable and interesting in companies that are doing all these things in one shot. Initially, they were only solar companies. Now there's more of the home improvement project companies which are able to do all of these. So, so we're finding a lot of value in that. Obviously, um, uh, you know, EV um, uh, and uh, newer um, home improvement and home energy solutions, we expect those will uh, come online and then we'll be able to bring those solutions to the market as and when they are ready for prime time. But um, that's a little bit of, one of the other things that we did uh, last year was we brought a 18 month um, you know, deferred interest loan, which did not exist at all. It was something related to COVID uh, that we conceived on the spot because people wow. during the downtime would not have the cash to pay down and they would not also want to pay interest uh, during an economic uncertainty. So what we were able to do was bring in an 18 month um, uh, loan to finance their clean energy installations. And then uh, on the back end of that transfer, translate that to a 25 year loan. So, you know, they would have um, the right uh, payment structure associated with delivering that value prop. That makes a ton of sense in current times and um, that you've really adapted to the environment, which was beyond your control. That's impressive. You mentioned there about battery becoming more mainstream, which I think is very interesting. Um, 
what do you see as the future? Like, what's what are you seeing as early signs of exciting technology in this realm? Like, do you see that, you know, we're going to move more off grid? Do you think it'll be a hybrid of grid dependency and, you know, self-sustainability? What, what, what does that look like for you? Like, what does the modern future, home of the future look like? I mean, this is this was un comprehend incomprehensible 20 years ago because of the cost of solar panels have come down dramatically what, what's i suppose a big question but like what's coming out now that's exciting and where do you see the future maybe even 10 20 years from now yeah um i, I think if you look at globally you, you know the climate challenge uh, is a global environmental challenge i think you know um but it's also a massive uh opportunity for us and the homeowners. So when I think about, um, you know, what drives that uh, penetration, you know, I think there was a recent study from, I think the International Renewable uh, Energy that basically said, we need to probably invest up to $131 trillion um, by 2050 uh, to get to, um, you know, the desired emission levels and be completely carbon free. That is a lot of investment in a lot of different technologies. Uh, the other data point from the Biden administration's recent solar futures basically says that solar alone can power, you know, up to a thousand megawatts. And what that means is up to 50, 55% can be completely driven uh, by solar, um, solar installations and solar driven uh, technologies. Now, the remaining part of that is going to be nuclear turbine, wind, and all those kind of things. But solar can be a huge dent in, in, um, in achieving those larger goals. So when I think about what is exciting, what is the path ahead, it really is, if you think about what's involved in delivering these solutions, the technologies are here today, but the ecosystem is fairly large. Interesting. And the ability to bring all the players in the ecosystem and financing is a very key part of it. I'm not saying financing is the only part, but financing is a majority part of ultimately how these projects get funded and get installed. So the ability to bring this ecosystem together. Today, the ecosystem is really evolving as we speak because there's newer opportunities that are coming on. There's newer policy things that are happening. And then the ability to consolidate and simplify the customer experience is really at the forefront of companies that are thinking through both on the installation and the customer acquisition side, but also on the back end side of getting compliance and working with the utility company in terms of turn up and the process of design verification. So the ability to bring this whole ecosystem together and then make it a seamless experience for everyone involved, I think is a key part of where we're seeing the next three to five years. And part of what we're able to do is bring our technology platform to be able to enable the various points of sale, the various mm -hmm. points of interaction with the consumer, the flexibility that the installers need. A lot of these installers are small installers. You know, we work with large installers and we have 22 nationwide, 2200 nationwide installers. So there's a lot of mom and pop shops that are also doing these mm -hmm. home improvements and solar projects. And for them, the ability to have various flexibilities involved in getting funded and also the mechanisms uh, for making financing available are different for them. And the ability to deliver all of those, we think will accelerate the um, uh, deployment of uh, clean energy projects. And that is a key part of our focus to be able to uh, build that out, build out the platform that can be globally applicable to not just the projects that we offer today, but financing can be more of an equalizer in terms of the types of projects we can support. Because if today we can do solar, we can do roofing, windows, it can easily extend to other types of um, clean energy solutions. And then thinking about what we bring to the table really is um, you, you know, the financing option to connect various financial institutions with the homeowners and these uh, providers were more a platform play than anything else. So all of that gives us really a lot of uh, exciting opportunity in terms of what the future lies and where we can play. Very cool. And I think it's very much a shift in mindset. It's this idea of adopting and being open to it. And I think your, your point earlier was absolutely key around it being an economic discussion. 
So if you can take the upfront cost and the CapEx piece off the table, I want to say it's a little bit like SaaS was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. That's you know, right. Where SaaS was a shift in mindset. It's this idea of, you know, you pay monthly or you pay for the year up front and all the incentive is on renewals and stickiness and the obligation the vendor has to you rather than the days of sending a DVD out. I think that the economic model of what's happening here is very akin to what happened in the SaaS business and on-prem, et cetera, um, from, from a uh, setup perspective. So that makes sense in my mind, at least. Anyway, um, shifting gears a bit. Um, tell me about your experience with culture and leadership and how you inspire others. And, you know, what are your must haves in your team? You know, what are your deal breakers and red flags and, you know, kind of value pillars that you believe in that, you know, have stood you in good stead across your, you know, be it Mosaic or others, you know, that you found has really brought value and, and predictability, so to speak, for delivery? Yeah, I think there's probably two questions that are embedded in what you asked. The first yeah. one is around maybe the leadership principles and then the values. Uh, maybe if I can take them as two separate parts. I think sure. as, as a leader, um, I think it's really important how you inspire the team. And, and that really brings together the cohesiveness that's important and the ability to um, uh, connect with the team. So uh, the how is really critical, but as a leader, you're also responsible for the what because your team needs to uh, really deliver both. So uh, I've thought about both of those. And, and some of this is really from my days at Intuit into maybe five foundational pillars. Um, the first one I think I previously mentioned is the ability to really think strategically. Uh, so that's the first pillar. So when I look for new talent or when I'm talking to my team today, I talk about these five pillars. I think it's a framework that I've uh, communicated to the team. I've internalized very um, uh, crisply so that I can use it um, you know, uh, as a fluid tool basically to be able to discuss and explain to various team members what areas of growth or also to evaluate talent on where they sit on each of those pillars. So the first one is the ability to think uh, strategically. And to me, that really is the ability to balance the short and long and how do you balance both of those and how you make those decisions. I think the second one is around building a high performing team. You know, how you hire talent, how you retain talent. What are your uh, specific skills? What are your things that you, um, um, uh, focus on in terms of uh, getting the team energized and um, uh, engaged. The third one, I believe, is generally around drive for results. This is the key part of the how, you know, the what, which is if you can't get it done, all the other things don't matter. So your ability to ask the right questions, your ability to step in at the right time, your ability to organize the teams in the right way, your ability to structure the project, your ability to think about the solution the right way. So mm -hmm. those all go into kind of the drive for results. And then the next one is really you being an innovative leader. How can you think about not just your today thing, but how are you thinking about new technologies? How are you thinking about new solutions, new processes? So everyone can innovate in different areas. And so that's kind of the fourth tip. And then the last one is, how do you inspire the teams through your action? Um, and then that's really about communication. That's really about your say-do ratio uh, and um, you know, um, your ability to ultimately um, uh, bring the team together in ways that they're willing to go over and beyond what's just their day-to-day -day task. So I feel like those are the five pillars that have helped me and then maybe if I can transition that into the values, that's almost in some way starting with your say do becomes a very critical thing. The employees have to be able to trust what you say. How do you build that say do? Um, you show up every day. I think that's an important part of sure. how I think about setting the tone for the organization. And as a leader, finally, your good judgment and your decision making is really a key part. People want to be able to trust in your judgment and decision making. And to me, that comes down to how you take data inputs, what data do you rely on, how do you use your instinct, 
And then finally, how do you blend both of those with your experience over the years so that you can actually blend in all of those and make the right judgment calls? Your teams look for generally uh, the right uh, kind of judgment calls. And that's an important part of leadership. So I feel like those are probably the two, um, uh, two aspects that blend into the leadership. On the values front, I think, um, you know, I, I feel customer empathy is a key part of the value. I think a lot of companies uh, have made this a key pillar, uh, but really thinking about the customer first, uh, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's Amazon or whether it is Intuit or other companies, I've learned how critical that is over the years to be able to really think about customer first. Um, you know, though employees are really critical, uh, you know, customers ahead of shareholders really thinking in that order uh, drives, I think, clarity in terms of uh, first things first. Uh, teamwork is very critical. Uh, equality and diversity, uh, really giving the team uh, a even footing in terms of the people that you bring in, the people that you hire, and the ability to have diverse thought process, I think is really critical. And then maybe an intangible one is really empathy and care. Uh, I think in some ways, values are something that, um, you know, you you have to stretch yourself. And when you have a team that can bond around some of these, I think it creates a more cohesive environment. So I feel like, um, you know, those four or five values kind of uh, go together for me. Yeah, no, I could, I couldn't agree with you more. And, um, you know, I heard, if I were to paraphrase there, a lot of action, a lot of accountability, a lot of integrity, um, a lot of doing, um, conducting yourself as you would expect others to conduct themselves, setting an example. That's kind of what was resonating for me um, throughout the course of that. And I think, you know, from your background, you shared at the very beginning of our discussion, I think that very, very much shone through and what you expect from others it's and it's it's not a big ask it's it's just the way that you would carry yourself and i like that philo- philosophy and that approach for sure i think that makes a ton of sense um so just as we round the corner here we t- we tend to ask a kind of a quirky uh, question um which tends to be you know tell us about a gadget in your life or a tool you know something you spent a hundred a couple of hundred bucks on recently that you know you know has become an integral part of your life people have said my iphone watch my um you know i see you've got earbuds on our call today maybe it's a tool to map your run maybe it's something in your car that makes the difference what what tools do you use that you find i I can see your bookshelf is very well populated so maybe reading is a big part of your life but what's inherently useful what's a day-to-day gadget or thing that you're your go-to in your life that enriches you so to speak um I'll, um, I think as you were asking that question, my mind was racing through like 20 <laughs> things that- uh, like to put you on the spot, yeah. Yeah, um, but I think I think the one that's uh, coming to mind is I bought a drone about eight months ago. Nice. And part of the intent was I recently hiked Kilimanjaro. Whoa. And I, and I did not um, at the time realize uh, that drones were not allowed there, but that was the motivation for buying That's one. For forgiveness, not permission, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, it's something that I've uh, really fallen in love with. I've, um, you know, it's not an easy thing, but I've spent hours trying to master taking kind of aerial photography. Uh, recently, my kids were both back home uh, and the ability to go and sit by a lakeside and take some really fun pictures and once in a while crash it back and forth navigating and trying to uh, you know, pick up a variety of skills. I'm planning to get actually uh, trained and certified to be a, a, a drone pilot, but Ooh. it's something that's um, really become a passion and fascination for me recently. So I'm very much in the early stages, but uh, it's a gadget that um, you know, I've just totally loved recently. Okay, now I'm jealous. Okay, so I'm officially jealous because my son and I, who's eight, often go to the store where they have a nice selection of them. And, you know, he said, when can we get this one? And I say, well, when mummy allows us, um, you know, quite <laughs> frankly. So for now, it's it's uh, it's on the back burner. But um, I, I think uh, it's definitely in my future for now. And, and maybe this this conversation will add weight to that argument I have and that discussion I have with my wife. So I appreciate the insights. Well, look, 
I just want to thank you sincerely for the uh, conversation, for the deep insight you gave into your own background to where you are with Mosaic and, and your kind of leadership structure as well. I got a ton of uh, value from it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And we'd be delighted to extend a welcome back to you on the show anytime in the future. Thank you, Ross. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank Great. You. Great. Our pleasure too. You've been listening to the Global Tech Leaders Podcast, designed for both established and aspiring career-focused tech rock stars, as well as helping leadership figure out how to speak global in today's multicultural world. For further details, check out sf-talent.com.